Well, unfortunately, I misplaced my angel costume this morning, so wasn't able to wear that, but uh, no, seriously, the kids did such a great job, didn't they? That was such a blessing to hear from them. I am both honored and excited to share with you all this morning. Uh, today is the third Sunday of Advent, and with that, the third week in our Christmas series titled Unexpected. And in keeping with this theme, I have a bit of an unexpected passage to share with you today. Uh, oftentimes, when pastors prepare sermons during Advent, we tend to preach from the Christmas passages in uh, Matthew, Luke, and even John, and that makes sense. But I have a bit of a curveball for you this morning. We're going to look at a story found in Daniel chapter 2. So you can get your Bibles out if you'd like. It'll be on the screen as well from Daniel chapter 2. Daniel is a very interesting book in the Old Testament. The first half is narrative following the life of a Jewish young man named Daniel, with the latter half focusing on the dreams and prophecies that Daniel was shown throughout his life. And chapter 2 is interesting in particular because even though it's in the narrative portion of this book, the chapter centers on a prophecy that quite literally reveals God's plan for the world. At this point in the biblical narrative, the Jewish people have been in this special covenant relationship with God for nearly 900 years. But for those of you who know the story, I think it's safe to say the relationship between Yahweh and his people was rocky at best. After years and years of abusing God's love, God finally decides that it's time to let Israel face the consequences of their sin. So in 722 BC, long time ago, 722, the northern kingdom of Israel falls to the hand of the Assyrians. This pagan nation sweeps into the Holy Land, captures the capital of Samaria, and wipes the kingdom out. Boom, they're gone. And not long after, the southern kingdom of Judah would follow suit. This time, God using the empire of Babylon to bring judgment upon his people. In the year 586, Babylon, likewise, uh, in a similar way to Assyria, would invade. This time they would invade Jerusalem and burn down the temple. But it was almost 20 years before this when Babylon first entered the Holy Land, taking with them the best and brightest of the Jewish young men, of which Daniel was part of that group. Now, before we get into Daniel 2, I really want to immerse you in his situation as best I can. Because so often we can read passages like this and it can kind of, um, it just kind of bounces off us sometimes. So I, I want to really immerse you in his situation if you would be willing to, to participate a bit this morning. Not only was Daniel uprooted by a foreign nation, a nation that was hostile towards his people, his way of life, and his God. Not only was Daniel forced to adopt the ways of this hostile nation in captivity, but catch this. The very hope of Daniel and his people had been dashed when Babylon invaded Jerusalem. Because at this point in scripture, the Jews believed that in a sense, they were the hope for the world. The kingdom of Israel was the hope for the world. God had called them to be a city on a hill. Their mission was to live in such a way that when they were in this covenant relationship with Yahweh, when the nations looked at Israel and how they lived with God, they were to come to know the character of God. So in a sense then, the Jews' hope was in the kingdom of Israel. But with the invasion of Babylon, their hope and dreams for a better world were crushed because the kingdom of Israel was crushed. This is the backdrop of Daniel chapter 2. Now, I don't have time to read the chapter, but I'm going to give you a quick summary one day, Daniel and his friends were minding their own business when the king's commander bursts into the house. Have you ever got a knock on your door and you're like, I'm, we're not expecting anyone? Like, okay, this was a rude call for them, or a rude wake-up call. He bursts into the house and informs them that the king has ordered their execution. 
That'd be a tough, tough uh, call to answer at the door, wouldn't it? Knock, knock. Hey, guess what? The king has ordered your execution. Now, Daniel, being the wise man that he was, calmly speaks to the commander and finds out the reason behind this brash order. Come to find out, the king was upset because he had had a dream that greatly troubled him and none of his officials could help him. All of the the wise magicians and dream interpreters, none of them could help him out. If you want to read the rest of the story, of course, you're welcome to do so, Daniel chapter 2. But it's the vision that the king had we're going to focus on today. Because this wasn't your ordinary dream. This wasn't like the classic, you go to a party in your underwear kind of dream, okay? Please, please tell me I'm not the only one that has had that dream. Absolute nightmare, okay? Um, (laughs) There was something about this dream that, quite honestly scared the king because this is what he saw. When the king first realized that he was dreaming, he saw before him a massive statue of a man. This appeared to be a man-made statue of a man, but much to the king's fascination, the statue was not crafted out of a single Metal. It was actually constructed of five different materials. The head was pure gold. The arms and chest were silver. The belly and thighs were bronze. The lower legs were iron. And the feet were partly iron and partly baked clay. Now, the king was a bit perplexed by this. But what he, what he saw standing next to the statue, what he saw just next to it, stood in stark contrast to the statue itself. When he looked over... Sitting at the feet of the statue, he saw a small, smoothened rock. A pebble, really. This tiny little thing appeared so insignificant next to the impressive statue. And even so, the king was struck by how pure the stone was. Compared to the chisel marks on the statue, the stone was described as being formed, but not by human hands. It was pure. It was flawless. It was, it was so round, it couldn't have been cut by human hands. And then, without warning, small little pebble propelled with such force. It struck the feet of the statue with such power that it nearly woke the king up. I'm embellishing a little bit, but you get what I'm saying. Um, The king was so dumbfounded by this. As cracks began to work their way up the statue, up uh, the feet, the legs, even into the core of the man, going so far as the arms and the head itself. And with a sudden burst of wind that came out of nowhere, the statue fell with a great crash. Can you guys clap this morning? A great crash. Clouds of dust shot into the air. The statue had been completely erased, and all that was left was the king. And something else. Because as the king looked on, when he looked where the statue had stood just moments before, his attention was brought back to the tiny little pebble that was somehow still there. Only this tiny little pebble appeared to be growing. As the seconds passed, the the pebble grew by leaps and bounds until it became a massive boulder that stood towering over the king. And before he could grasp what was happening, the rock morphed so large that it became a mountain that it was said filled the whole earth. And just as the king stood with his neck craned, admiring the beauty of the mountain compared to the statue that had stood just moments before, he woke up. What did that dream mean? 
there had to be some kind of significance. This is why the king is such in a, a tizzy, because he knows there's something special about this dream, and yet no one can help him out. Except for one person. Daniel. You see, 600 years later, as the Jews were agonizingly awaiting a king from the line of David, a ruler that they hoped would overthrow the Romans and restore the kingdom that Babylon had destroyed, a young engaged couple made the journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Not long after, the woman who was pregnant despite being a virgin, explain that one, that doesn't make much sense, this woman goes into labor. This poor woman and her soon-to-be husband, despite their circumstances, couldn't even find a place to have the baby. So they have to bunk with the livestock. And this unexpected baby, born in an unexpected place, was destined to become Israel's unexpected king. Now that doesn't mean that the Jews weren't looking for a Messiah. Of course they were. But it was the kind of Messiah this baby would turn out to be that would cause such a stumbling block. Because as Simeon would prophesy, this baby boy would cause the rise and fall of many in Israel. The Jews were expecting a king. But not the kind of king that this man would be. Just as the Jews were expecting a kingdom but not the kind of kingdom that this man was anointed to establish. When the people wanted a kingdom that would make the Romans pay for what they had done, this man would preach, love your enemies. When the people wanted a kingdom that would force all others to bow before it, this man would preach, blessed are the meek, or blessed are the submissive. When the people wanted a kingdom that would usher in God's reign over the world, they expected the king of this kingdom to bear a sword, not a cross. This man was named Jesus. And as he would later tell Pilate, you are right in saying I am a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. And so, this unexpected king, ushering in an unexpected kingdom, became the rejected king, leading a rejected kingdom. And the sad truth is, things haven't changed all that much, have they? Church, we live in a world that idolizes money, power, and revenge, where success is defined by how many toes you step on and how many people you manipulate to get to the top. But guess what? It was never meant to be this way. And Lifeway, it won't remain this way forever. Because as Jesus himself proclaimed, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. The small, insignificant pebble was beginning to grow in size and power. And despite the massive statue of worldly nations and methods that it stood against, the kingdom of God could not be stopped. Not even the gates of hell itself could stand against what God had ordained. The unexpected king was beginning to usher in a new era of God's reign on the earth through his people, the church. The kingdom of Israel may have failed, just as spectacularly as the statue had fallen in the king's dream. But the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God would triumph through love for one another, and in so doing would fill the whole earth, just as the church has done since Jesus commissioned his followers 2,000 years ago. Amen. So the question for us then, what does all of that mean? What does that mean for us in our lives? What does that mean for us as a church, as believers in Jesus? I think three things come to mind. I think each of them could and probably should be a sermon of their own. But when the unexpected king rules over us and we live as citizens in this unexpected kingdom, we are to live in a counter-cultural way, aren't we? 
So here are just three marks of Jesus' kingship in our lives. Number one, political peace. When Jesus is our king and we live in his kingdom, our country or even the world can be falling apart. And guess what? It doesn't matter because our hope is not in the United States. Our hope is not in the United Nations or which party controls Congress. Our hope rests in Jesus Christ and his perfect kingdom. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't care about our country. Of course we should. I love being an American. But as a follower of the king, I am a dual citizen. And my primary citizenship, it's not here. It's in the kingdom of God. Let me ask you this morning, where's yours? Where is your primary citizen, citizenship this morning? Point number two, when Jesus is king of our lives, I call this selective service. Now, this is not selective service as in getting drafted, but kind of a similar meaning. When Jesus is king of our lives, we are given a mission and a purpose in life. So many people spend so much time and energy in our world looking for purpose and looking for meaning, trying to, to find themselves. Have you heard that phrase before? We have such a hope that we are given a purpose and a mission in Jesus. Our mission, catch this, our mission is Jesus' mission to advance the kingdom of God. It's kind of like uh, the, the old song I, I grew up with. Those of you I talked to, you ready to help me out? I know everyone's going to help me with this, but okay. So there's a song I grew up with when I was in, in kids' church, okay? And it goes something like this. I'm too small to march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I'm too small to fly or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. <laughs> I heard some different lyrics than what I grew up with. So maybe there's different versions of that song. I don't know. <laughs> As citizens in Christ's kingdom, we're not just civilians. We're not called to just stand on the sidelines and watch. We are called. We are commissioned. We are drafted, if you will, to serve our king and his mission. How are you doing with that? In your life right now, just ask yourself, how am I doing with that? And number three, worry wanes. When Jesus is king of our lives, the worry in our life should wane. Now, I have a bit of a confession this morning. I'm a bit of an idealist, and that is a tremendous understatement. <laughs> I am a huge Idealist. And so when things don't go according to my plan, I often have to fight uh, feelings of frustration and, and just kind of irritation more than anything. Like, why couldn't this have gone the way I was hoping it would? Okay. But when Jesus is king, we can trust what he's doing, even if it doesn't make sense. Can I say that again? When Jesus is king, we can trust what he's doing, even when it doesn't make sense. I love how C.S. Lewis portrays uh, Aslan in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. There's a moment where Susan and Lucy are inquiring what Aslan is like. And Lucy asks if Aslan is safe. One of the main characters, Mr. Beaver, he kind of replies with a slight scoff. He says, safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good. He's the king. When Jesus is king, 
there will be many seasons when he calls us to something that does not feel safe. Maybe that's you right now. I don't know. Maybe God's been tugging at your heart, saying, I'm calling you to do this, and it doesn't feel safe. But we can always trust, despite our circumstances, that he is good. He is the king, and he works all things for the good of those who love him. Lifeway, would you stand? As the band comes forward, we've been doing a mini-series on Wednesday nights called Why Christmas for the past two weeks. We've been talking about why Christmas is such a big deal. And here's the thing. We celebrate Christmas for a lot of different reasons. It's a fantastic holiday. But everything about Christmas comes down to Jesus. The unexpected king has come. And he has begun to usher in an unexpected kingdom. As we go into this last song, I just challenge you to consider this morning just these four things. You ready? Ask yourself, is Jesus really king of my life? He may be savior, but is he king? Is your hope in his kingdom or yours? Are we living on mission? And do you trust him over yourself? Lifeway, our king is not safe, but he is good. Let's worship him.